Chapter 388 In the Hands of Terrorists, Part 2 Although the police released Hatch by Lal Ahmed after 24 hours, still it kept him under close watch. It so happened that after a couple of days from the day some gunman kidnapped Irshad the police made startling discovery. By Lal's movements, contacts, phone conversations and email correspondence were always observed by the RCMP. By Lal sent an email from a public library to someone. The police was able to trace the recipient of that email letter to a computer in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In his letter by Lal informed the recipient that the boys are not ready to hand over the girl to him until he deposit their shares. The letter also included two bank accounts. The police was able to identify the holders of those accounts as gang members of the Mad Cow Gang. The police also informed the Bank of Montreal to freeze any money deposited that day in those two accounts. The police did not make any arrest until the money was deposited in those accounts. The amount that deposited was 15 million US dollars in each account. Under the instruction of the RCMP the bank did not show the money on the accounts. As soon as the police came to know that the money was transferred into the Bank of Montreal the RCMP arrested by Lal Ahmed. At first the police could not find the other two gangsters. By Lal tried to deny his involvement in the kidnap but when he was confronted with the evidence he talked out and revealed the entire plot. Through him the police was able to locate those two criminals. The RCMP surprised the two gangsters in a First Nation reserve in the province of Manitoba. In a small house the police was able to find Irshad imprisoned in a hole. Since the day she was kidnapped from the hotel Irshad was imprisoned by her kidnappers in that remote reserve. She was kept in a hole that dug for her grave. Her kidnappers were planning to bury her alive after they get their share from those who hired them. The kidnappers refused to kill Irshad until the money was deposited in their accounts. By law knew the gangsters would not tell him where they took Dr. Ibtahul unless they were paid. In order to avoid the police by law did not contact his accomplice in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia until he thought the police no more keeping watch on him. The RCMP was able to rescue Irshad from her kidnappers alive. It was shocking and breaking news to the world when the Winnipeg police announced that Irshad was rescued from her kidnappers alive and unharmed. After the arrest of the other two gangsters the police was able to unearth the entire plot from its roots in Saudi Arabia. First of all the RCMP was able to trace the account from which the 30 million US dollars was transferred into the accounts of the two gangsters to one of the royal sheikhs in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. However, the government of Saudi Arabia denied any involvement in the plot. The ambassador of that country said the sheikh who paid that amount worked independently without the knowledge of any other members of the royal family or the police. Nevertheless, the Saudi government refused to hand over the sheikh to the government of Canada for trial. This stand created tension between the two countries. The RCMP collected enough evidence pointing to the fact that some sheikhs from the royal family in Saudi Arabia were involved in the kidnap of a Canadian citizen and the conspiracy to kill her. The confessions of the Muslim terrorist Bilal Ahmed and the other two Canadian gangsters revealed that the plot to kidnap and kill Irshad was planned in Maka city when Bilal went for pilgrimage. While Bilal was performing the religious rituals of pilgrimage he became acquainted with some men who belonged to the Somali terrorist group known as Al-Shabaab. When those terrorists came to know that Bilal was from Canada they seized the golden opportunity and convinced him to plan the assassination of Irshad. The Somali terrorists presented Bilal with a Somali girl and then introduced him to a Saudi sheikh known the Prince Sheikh Osman bin Zidan. This sheikh connected by law with other sheikhs from the royal family. Those sheikhs promised to pay $50 million to by law if he planned and carried out the assassination of Irshad. However, by law was told that not a single dollar would be paid to him until the blasphemous woman was killed. By law accepted the deal and promised to assassinate the woman in question. As soon as by law returned to Canada with his new wife, he began to look for some gangsters to hire for the murder. He contacted some of his ex-gang members and disclosed to them the secret deal. 
Bilal lied about the amount of the bounty that the sheikhs promised to pay. He told the gangsters that the amount was $30 million and he promised to pay it all to the gang. He decided to get $20 million and pay $30 million to the two gangsters who agreed to join him in the kidnap and the assassination. Bilal used his wife and opened account in her name in a bank in Switzerland. Then he contacted the Saudi sheikhs and gave them the account number of his wife and requested them to deposit $20 million in that account. When the kidnap took place the sheikhs asked for solid proof that the blasphemous woman was killed. Bilal could not able to provide such a proof because the other two gangsters insisted that they would not kill their victim until the money was paid to them. Moreover, they had their captive and kept her away from the reach of Bilal. Accordingly, Bilal tried to convince the sheikhs to pay the money in order for him to convince the gangsters to hand over to him the blasphemous woman. He promised that he would videotape the assassination of the woman and then send the video to the sheikhs. For some time either of the two sides was ready to compromise in his condition. On one side the gangsters demanded to be paid first and then hand over the victim to Bilal while on the other side the sheikhs refused to pay until they get proof that the blasphemous woman was killed. Bilal could not able to convince either side. Finally, the sheikhs agreed to pay $30 million to the two gangsters first and then pay Bilal after he would send the proof of the assassination. When the sheikhs deposted the 30 millions, the RCMP stepped in at the right time and saved Irshad from being assassinated by Bilal Ahmed. Irshad did not take seriously the threats of Muslims until she was kidnapped and about to be buried alive by those ruthless criminals. She decided to exercise some caution in her campaign of exposing the abuses that she experienced as a Muslim woman in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. She knew that her speeches in Canada and France did so much damage to Islam. She exposed the deception and lies of the Muslims living in the West who tried to show that Islam is the religion of peace and love and Muslim women are treated with all respect and placed in position that made them equal with their counterpart men. She also demonstrated through her speeches that the Quran and the Hadiths of the Prophet Muhammad were manual for creating and spreading terrorism all over the world. Irshad's speeches in Islam were recorded and circulated in many Western countries. In a few months she became so famous and popular among non-Muslims. Before she was kidnapped she was scheduled to speak in all major cities in Canada. She even received invitations from some churches and universities in America. Although she knew that her speeches made her target for the Islamic terrorists still Irshad decided to carry on her campaign. As soon as Irshad was rescued from the terrorist Bilal and his gang she travelled to the United States of America and delivered many speeches. In all her speeches she concentrated on three topics, her experience as Muslim woman, the status of Muslim women, and terrorism in the Quran and the Hadiths. Many Muslims attended her speeches in the USA and tried desperately to refute her. Those Muslims made fun of themselves by trying to apply the law of Taqiyya which allowed them to lie deliberately in order to protect their religion. Irshad confronted them with undeniable verses of the Quran and authentic hadiths of the Prophet Muhammad. Irshad's speeches in America made her to be known worldwide. Everyone in the world came to know that the same woman who was exposing the evils of Islam was the same woman who once was the wife of one of the 19 terrorists who took part in the cowardly terrorist attacks on New York on September 11, 2001. She also was the informant who helped the NATO commandos to arrest the notorious terrorist the Mullah Sheikh Mohammed Noor. Wherefore, the world believed every word she said about the evils of Islam because she considered as an eyewitness. Her testimony was heartbreaking and big stigma on the face of every Muslim who continued to follow that satanic cult after hearing it. People had pity on her whenever they heard her testimony. Many women broke in tears while Irshad was telling her bitter experience of being a Muslim wife in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. She repeatedly said in her speeches that it was the greatest crime to be committed against the woman was to make her a Muslim woman. Muslim woman was abused when she was four or five years old by subjecting her to that cruel and inhumane religious practice of genital mutilation. When she was eleven or twelve she could be raped and abused on the pretension of marriage. 
No one could object to child marriage in Islam because Muhammad abused and raped the child of his friend Abu Bakr when she was nine years old. Even there was an official fatwa issued in Saudi Arabia that the Prophet Muhammad used to masturbate on the thighs of Aisha when she was between six and nine years old. According to that fatwa he used to put his penis between her thighs and rub it gently until he ejaculated. How could a pedophile person like Muhammad be a messenger of God? Irshad asked this question again and again and no one could either answer it or refute her.